<laughs> Welcome to the second line show. I'm your host, Nolan Ash. Let's let the good times roll. <laughs> Hi, welcome once again to the Second Line Show. I am Nola Nash, and we've got a great show for you today. We have some wonderful ladies joining us. We've got some fabulous little noises in the background, though. They're perky, and we like them, so we're going to let them stay, because they are going to make the show a lot of fun. We've decided it sounds like little ducks and kind of doing their little thing in the water. We like it. It's cute. All right, so I am going to let our authors introduce themselves to you, tell you a little bit about their work. Um something let's see your favorite halloween candy i always have something weird like how you take your coffee and think so today <laughs> yeah <laughs> you get to tell me a little bit you know tell the audience a little bit about your your work um what you like to write um and your favorite halloween candy and guys as they are introducing themselves please make sure that you are going to be putting your comments in the comment section over there. Uh, yes, Janet, I can see your name. Awesome. Um, if you are not have not given stream your permission, you're going to want to put your name in the comments so we can address you directly so we can see who you are. Um, you just need to give stream your permission to access your Facebook profile or put your name in the comments for us so that we can see who's here hanging out with us. So keep those comments coming and I'm going to keep an eye on those as well as our ladies here are chatting and some of those comments will make it up on the screen. And I know that we can't get to every single one of them as we talk. Um, we will kind of skip around as we go, but know that I always go back through the comments and I know our guests usually do as well. So get those comments in there and we will do our best to answer any questions that you have that way as well. All right, ladies, I'm going to let you introduce yourselves. We're going to start with, because um, Linda, you're over here. I'm going to let you go first. So uh, tell us all about yourself. Okay, well, in two minutes, my name is Linda Malou. I'm an adventure travel writer. At this juncture in my life, that's basically what I'm doing is adventure travel. And I have this book, Lost Angel Walkabout, that uh, is a collection of travel essays. And I just put it in audiobook format. And I have audible coupons for listeners who would like to see, have it for free. But I also have this book uh, in California. I live in California, so I have 32 day trips up the coast that I love that uh, I'm sharing in that book. Uh, and the other thing I did this year in the COVID thing, I had time to do uh, get great trips for free because a lot of people want to know what, how to become a travel writer. I mean, it is the greatest job in the world. So uh, travel writer wannabes, uh, get great trips for free. And then on my YouTube page, I have a playlist with, with more tips for people who would like to join me in this wonderful adventure. Of course, my wings are clipped now, but uh, I am writing a, a no my next novel right now in this time, and it's called Embrace of the Wild. So there you have it. Oh, nice title. All Not right. <laughs> I love that. It's fantastic. All right. So Mandy, going over to you now, my dear. Hi, so my name is Mandy Haynes. I am the author of two collections of short stories, Walking the Wrong Way Home, which came out last year. It's actually, it'll be a year next month. And Sharp as a Serpent's Tooth, even other stories just came out, um, gosh, the 28th of September. I like to write realistic literary fiction um, with this, I always say with a southern drawl, they're very southern. Yes, um, ma'am. I'm kind of going to hear that drawl. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yep, that's what I write. I'm working on a novel. Actually, it's in its first draft um, stages. So, as soon as this settles down and I'm not so busy trying to promote the second book, I'm um, going to get started on that, which the last story in the second collection is actually, it's um, part of the novel. It was, a, it started oh. out as a chapter of the novel and then I, I, you know, did a little work on it. So it's not the chapter anymore, but it's the name of that story is Cousin Snakes and Candy Cigarettes. But the novel is with the new, t with the new tongue spoken. So um, oh. that's me. And my favorite Halloween candy is anything chocolate. 
It's what? Uh, anything, anything chocolate. Linda, <laughs> oh, what's your favorite yeah. Halloween candy? Peanut butter cups. Peanut um, butter cups. <laughs> so good. All right. So Maria, you're down here kind of to, uh, you're kind of, we did the Brady Bunch thing. You're like, we're here. <laughs> we got the glitter here. So I'm going to go down to Maria over here, give you the solo cam here. So Maria, tell us all about yourself, please, my dear. Hi, I'm Maria Henriksen, and I am both a fiction and nonfiction writer. I have my debut novel here um, that came out um, last August, and it is a young adult Christian romance novel. It's a little edgy, um, so there's it's very descriptive and uh, keeps you on your toes. Um, it's not peachy keen like. Like totally super clean um, type of a book, but uh, I did that intentionally, especially for today's youth, um, because uh, you know they're so desensitized to things, and I wanted that it to be a page turner for them. And then more recently, um, last month, uh, the nonfiction book came out. And this is love. I am one of 13 contributors to it. And it's a 40 day devotional. So each day, a uh, different writer has a little snippet, uh, you know, little window to um, what it means in their life, uh, how God is, speaks to them. And it's um, been helpful to uh, many people so far. It's the total name is Love Not Stories of Faith, Family, and Friendships. So um, I hope you uh, take a look. And funny thing is, by coincidence, they both have similar colors. I had nothing to do with that. <laughs> but, <laughs> my favorite colors, too. I was like, yes. <laughs> my favorite uh, candy. I'm with you guys. And that would be Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. Oh, and by the way, a little side note. Um, my daughter and I went for a walk today. And, of course, we can't resist a trip to get some ice cream. So I don't know if you have Sonic near you. Mm -hmm. but they had a special today. And my daughter <laughs> orders and says, can you swap out the Snickers for Reese's <laughs> Peanut for Butter Cups? Because it's got a combination of M&M's and uh, Oreos and Snickers. And I was like, yeah, yeah, do that with mine. Do that with mine. <laughs> so they did it. It was awesome. We're always changing stuff up. We should drive people crazy all the time. So. <laughs> uh, I always get the Snickers and I add hot fudge and I get it on All right. So, yeah. we, uh, so when you add the hot fudge, though, you got to eat it fast. Because the hot fudge, it's hot. It melts the ice cream. <laughs> Ah. You, gotta, it, you do have a problem because otherwise your ice cream just goes all the way. It tastes really good. Uh, let's see, Caitlin, we'll let you introduce yourself to the people, please. Okay, hey, I'm Caitlin Hamilton Summy. I am a book publicist of about 25 years. And three years ago, I had my first short story collection published called To Lay to Rest Our Ghosts. It is not about ghosts, it's about family and forgiveness and reconciliation and putting to rest all the petty, or actually not not always petty, um, divisions that make it hard sometimes to put up with your loved ones. Um, I'm proud that I got it done. It took me 25 years. Um, and it won the Philip H. McMath Post-Publication Book Award and, and second place in the Forward Indies. So that was really exciting. Um, I don't yeah. have it here. Yay! I don't have it here because I was having tech problems and I didn't get to grab it um, coming up the stairs because I was trying to solve tech problems. Um, I will show the cover at the end. I've got a slide with everybody's covers on it. So I think awesome. that's it's on there as well. So we'll get to at least see it there. Okay. And um, I just found out last month that my first novel will be coming out from uh, Fomite, who published my short story collection in January of 2022. Um, so that's really exciting. And it's called Geographies yeah. of the Heart. And my oh, favorite nice. Halloween candy is also anything chocolate. <laughs> Love it. 
All right, so I, I have a consensus that this is unpopular opinion time. So please don't not watch the show because of this unpopular opinion of mine. There are two things that I can't stand <laughs> that everyone seems to love, and that is Nutella and Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. <laughs> I just don't like them. I don't like Nutella either. I don't like to tell it weird. Okay, but I don't feel so alone in that one. But Reese's peanut butter cups. So it's the the texture of the peanut butter. And I, I struggle with chocolate and peanut butter together anyway. But there's something about the Reese's cups. I, I, everybody else loves them, and it's just like I. I mean, anytime I get those, like something for my students or whatever, I'm like tossing them off to my kids, and they're like, "Yes, mom got Reese's. We <laughs> have Reese's." <laughs> like. But unpopular opinion, I know. I'm fully aware that that's an unpopular opinion. Uh, my favorite Halloween candy is Almond Joy. I love Almond Joy. Uh, well, so, uh, close second. Them. Close second, yeah. Almond Joy and those. Twix are kind of my thing. I like green Almond Joy or Twix and, and I'm missing chocolate. I think we're all in. Yes, Elgin, I don't like Nutella. <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I told you it's an unpopular opinion. I prefaced that. <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering if everybody even knows what Nutella is. I don't. I, mean, I, don't. So, I know the, the kids. I mean, the kids I mean, eat it all the time. My kids absolutely love it. Um, Annie, wow. Annie's chiming in down here. She loves all things Reese's. Annie, I, I hope you still love me after my. Now I like Reese's pieces. I do not like the peanut butter cups, but I will eat some Reese's pieces. So oh. I'll at least, I'll give you lots of compromise, I guess, <laughs> on that one. Um, Sarah went does not like Nutella or chocolate. You know, Sarah, you want to talk about unpopular opinions, honey? That's the <laughs> <one>. <laughs> it's an unpopular opinion. That Anytime I meet somebody that doesn't like chocolate, I'm always like, why not? Like, why uh, not? I wish I did. That would be 50 pounds lighter. Right. <laughs> My mother does not like chocolate. I mean, I grew up in a house with a woman who doesn't like chocolate. So I think I eat all the chocolate now just as like retribution for the years I spent getting like fruit flavored desserts because she didn't like chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we had a whole lot of strawberry shortcake and things that I still love. I'm like, that woman does not like chocolate. What is wrong with you? But she will put down some Rocky Road ice cream. That is the only chocolate that that woman will eat. It's hilarious. That but is funny. I know. Like, that's what you like. It's my favorite ice cream, too. And I wonder if that's because that's the chocolate I had as a kid growing up. <laughs> <'Cause that's laughs> what liked. So it's like, yes, Rocky Road. I love it. But anyway, so... Mandy, you kind of got us into one of the questions that I do want to talk about. Now, we're, we're clearly talking short form writing here, whether it is, you know, travel writing that Linda does or short stories and all those things. Um, and one of the things that I do want to talk about a little bit, Mandy, is, is how your short term, your short form writing sometimes turns into long form writing with the novel. So. That's kind of where we're going tonight, guys. And I, I guess you kind of figured we try to film the shows a little bit. So we've got folks that have some similar platform here. Um, yes, Christine, MMs are the best. I love MMs. Absolutely love MMs. There's a lot of chocolate here in the comments. I love it. So, yes, no, Lori, I love you, but Reese's one of my favorite. I'm sorry. Everybody in the comment is now debating chocolate and you know. <laughs> <laughs> you tell it. Um, so, all of you ladies, one, my first question for you, I guess, as a novel writer, I, I love reading the things I can't write well, I think, because it's one of those things. Um, people always say, you know, read the genre that you write, make sure you're, you know, you're kind of seeing what the market is like. And I like to do that, but I also really enjoy reading the things I can't write, that I know I can't do well. Um, I don't do poetry well. I'm, I'm terrible at poetry. I don't even, you do not even want to go there with me with poetry. It's horrible. I've tried it. I had to do it for school. No, we don't do that. And I love reading short stories. I absolutely adore short stories. It's one of my favorite things that as a teacher I get to teach. It's the art form in a short story. It's knowing that every word has to be perfect, that every word matters, every detail that you work in there has to be the right one because you don't have the large platform, you don't have the pages and pages 
to make the point that you're trying to make, to convey the setting, the mood, everything that you're trying to get your reader to feel, you're having to do it in that shorter format. It seems so difficult to me, as much as I love it. I mean, as a teacher breaking these things down, I can look at the, this word choice here, the phrases here, exactly what they were, were able to do in a paragraph that would have you know, maybe been a chapter in a novel, you know, of getting that story told. What makes you branch out? What makes you decide that's your medium? How did you get started in these kind of shorter formats when, you know, as a novelist, I can't even fathom trying to whittle everything that I wanted to say down into that short story. It, it's mind boggling to me and I'm in awe of it. So ladies, share with, with me that which you cannot do. <laughs> well, I got into short story writing because a friend of mine who was an, um, an English professor at Ball State was reading my novel in progress and he submitted a chapter from the novel to um, uh, to a competition. It was the first time I'd ever submitted anything or anything. I, I, I said, you know, I didn't really want to do it. So he submitted it. He just said, well, we're doing it. And it won first place. Wow. So it was a chapter yeah. of the novel. So that's, that's, that. I was hooked then, you know, it's like, oh my God. Yeah. Um, I love that. Now, Vault State. I'm going to put you on the spot here, Mandy. I know Vol State. I know where that is. Are you a Tennessee girl? Yes. I'm from Nashville. Well, I'm from Greenbrier, but I lived in Nashville for the last. How did I not know that, Mandy? I don't know. I'm in Franklin. <laughs> like, I don't know. Are you serious? Look behind me, girl. Look, look. Read what's behind me. Read those words. Look at this. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Look at the Williamson County going on my head. Oh my gosh. I don't even know this, Mandy. That's so funny. I don't, I'll tell that's you what, funny. You know somebody. <laughs> yeah, three years ago, I quit my job, uh, put my house up for sale, and oh. left Tennessee. Oh my oh, goodness. Uh, see, that's that. Hurricane season scares me in Florida, but I love everything that's about Florida. Uh, Christine wants to know if the fact that she only ever understood Poe's poetry makes her dark and scary. Yes, Christine. <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't, make you, it doesn't make you dark and scary. Poe happens to be near and dear, and dear to my heart. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be right there with you on that one, Christine. Um, I, I am doing a, we're doing Poe-tober with my eighth graders. So every oh, week we're cool. it, breaking down a different short story. So again, like I said, I love short stories. I love to teach them. Can't write them. Cannot write them at all. Oh, Annie says that she loves your story. Annie. Oh, thank you. Shout out from Annie McDonald. We love Annie. Um, got a little uh, plug for something Annie's working on a little bit later. I am not know if you love dog or So we're going to uh, gonna talk about that just a little bit later. Um, so you probably know how many women with award winning from the very beginning of their short story. It was a fluke, but man, I was hooked. <laughs> and me. So how, how did you guys get into this? Now, Lindy, you got into it. You got into doing short form by travel writing. So you were writing. Right, right, right. Right. Let me let me talk about travel essays, because that's what my book is. It's a, it's a collection of travel essays. And it's really travel memoir. Uh, but it has a dramatic spine, you know, and the dirty little secret of, of, of travel writing is that something bad has to happen. You start out, yeah, you start out with an inciting incident, uh, you know, something horrible that happened, and and then you work yourself backwards into the story, and, you, you know, you have a, a, a resolution and a buttoning up. And I love travel narratives. I love reading them. I love writing them. They're my favorite form. I am a novelist. I do have not two novels to my credit, but we're going to stick with the travel stuff because I think that's, you know, where I'm at for the most part right now. And I did a travel essay called uh, Writing in the Hoofprints of Isabella Burke. And she was a travel writer in 1873 that I so identified with this woman. I mean, she was just incredible. She, she rode through the Rocky Mountains solo 800 miles in winter well late fall winter and you know wow. like her boots were frozen to the stirrups and 
you know, she stayed with the settlers and slept with the children. And I mean, this woman was just incredible. Wow. And she was, yeah, she was just an incredible woman who went on after this to go to Bhutan and Tibet and Korea and Japan, all solo. And she's a wonderful writer. And so I won an award for that essay that I wrote about her. But now, Embrace of the Wild is a historical novel based on her life. So I am into Isabella. I am, Iz I am Izzy, okay? I am Izzy. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Now, Chris, we've got a question for you, Lynn, as we're talking about travels. And, and I know you're, you said your wings and clips. You can't go anywhere. And of course, that is definitely the time we're in. But where have you traveled? Oh, oh my goodness. Well, uh, in Los Angeles Walkabout, I take you from Alaska, which is where I am from, uh, rafting on the Tachinchini River through the largest roadless wilderness area left in the world, in North America, not in the world, in North America, through glacier fields and all of it. So that's where the book opens. But I take you all the way to New Zealand, Costa Rica, uh, a lot of the Wild West of North America, because I'm an outdoor adventure travel writer. And so like I like hiking, I like kayaking, and I, my favorite mode of transport is on the back of a horse. Oh. So, but I love rivers, and I've rafted the Grand Canyon. I've, I've rafted the the, the uh, uh, Salmon River in Idaho, which is a fantastic river, and the Pacauri in you know in uh, Costa Rica. So, a uh, theme that's throughout my work, all of my work, is that nature can be our salvation. So I'm like very, 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 very connected with nature. Uh, as I say, I, I'm from Alaska and started out there in the wilds and became a hybrid. Uh, you know, I live in Los Angeles, uh, but I live in the Santa Monica Mountains. So I live in this enclave, which is as far out of L.A. as I can get without leaving L.A. <laughs> <laughs> so I found a nice compromise. A nice trick. <laughs> yeah, it's a good trick. It's a good trick. I like it. It's a good trick, and it's the best place to be during this year of the virus because I live mm -hmm. in the trees, and I just can walk out my door and go on the hikes, and I can go down to the beach. Uh, I mean, I do look forward to traveling, and when I do, I'm probably going to go to Colorado and spend about a month uh, sharing my book. Hopefully, I'll have it finished and published and uh, ready to go by 2021. And that's the, you know, embrace of the wild. Awesome. Now, Maria, how about you guys? How did you get into this world of portrait now? And Maria, you've got the novel as well. I love you said it in one of my favorite decades, 1980s. Um, but we also have short stories that go, that you, you have part of, that you contribute to that work. And Caitlin, you're a short story writer too. And I, I love the inspirational element that both of you bring to your short stories as well. So how did you get involved in, in that? Either one of you that wants to jump in. They're not jumping. Uh, for me, I mean, I started writing when I was really small, Jump. which I don't think is common. You know, I think everybody does. Um, but I don't know. I, I, you know, I kept writing and I kept writing. I ended up in an MFA program for a while. And that was wonderful, you know, because it allowed me to write. But I've just kept going despite... I call, I call my work and my children and my life, you know, they're happy interruptions. That's why it takes me so long to finish anything, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but I, I love just that keep term. Going. If I have five minutes, if I have 10, and, um, and I raise my happy interruptions. And I, the reason I was waving at you, Mandy, you probably think like, what is that crazy woman doing? Is because <laughs> I'm in Knoxville, so go balls. Um, ah! And so, you know, football, I have to take a break to watch some football. Tennessee yes, represent to today. Hello. Josh Dobbs. <laughs> yes, Tennessee represents today. So I've been writing all my life and I just continue in whatever way I can to make time for it. And I imagine, I mean, I, I write lots of different things, but I imagine that the reason I do stories is because my time is so compressed. And mm -hmm. my first, first priority has to be my family and my business. So if it's between promoting one of my authors or writing my book, I, I have to put my clients first. So I think mm -hmm. short stories are what makes sense in my world right now. 
I'd like to be I one of your it. clients. <laughs> I know. Okay. <laughs> I'll talk to you. Lucky clients. Oh my god. I, <laughs> I love that. But everybody they like your term. <laughs> the interruptions. <laughs> the children. Uh Christine's interruptions are all are, are all from my interruptions are, are from growing and scattered. I've only got one left head home with me, so and she's 14, so she wants nothing to do with me anymore. So she doesn't interrupt very much. <laughs> <laughs> right, you never see her. <laughs> you know, she's at that age. Now, Maria, your stories are a little different. You've got uh, that you are a fiction writer as well. Uh, you, know, you write for the Christian market, correct? For the fiction market? Is that what you said? Christian. Oh, Christian. Okay. Sorry. The little. <laughs> uh, yes, yes. Um, both of my nonfiction and fiction books are Christian. Uh, and the way I got into writing devotionals is because the publisher of the devotional book reached out to me before it was even a thought and she, the actual publication of the book and asked me to write for her for her blog. And I thought, well, I don't know why you're reaching out to me because I never wrote a devotional before in my life. And she was a little persistent. <laughs> so I thought, well, how hard could it be? Right? I mean, it's a little, it's supposed to be like 300 to, I don't know, 700 words, 600 is supposed to be, you know, ideal. And, um, I tried it and I liked it and uh, two of my devotions were selected for the book and I already have a couple written for 2021 and I have that have already been submitted and the idea is that we're probably going to have another book come out and then recently I had another crisis and every time I have a crisis my publisher says, Maria, write a devotion about it. <laughs> so <laughs> I <did. laughs> nice. yeah. yeah, so I wrote another one and um, I haven't submitted it yet. I need to in, um, include like another verse, usually write like a couple verses. Mm -hmm. And uh, I actually do enjoy it. It helps me to keep me centered and at peace with things um, so that I'm not freaking out. As my family knows, I have a way of freaking out. <laughs> so, um, it's actually helped with my growth, um, you know, my walk and my faith with, with God. So I'm very thankful for it. And I don't have to do the publication of it, which is awesome because I was self-published. And that is one of the things that I hate about being a writer, but I didn't want to go traditional. So, you know, that was a choice that I made. It wasn't because I was rejected or anything like that. I wanted the rights of everything and I, I wanted control, basically. I think everybody, I, I love that the market is, is such you that know, it's exciting. I don't really all need control, devotional yeah. type stuff. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's great that we can all find our niche and our, and our way that we're comfortable doing things, and whether it's traditional or independent. We've got such a diverse market out there that is embracing of so many different things. And, you know, the same thing. Oh, uh, Claudia has a question, Maria, before we kind of move away from, from what we're talking about here. She wants to know, um, if is your devotional for the younger set like teenagers? Uh, I don't know your, your novel is, yeah. but is, is it devotional or is it more... It's, it's actually, um, it can be, but it's not specifically for teenagers uh, because it's, it's love knots. So it's faith, family and friendships. Uh, so it can, it's really geared towards any age, not specifically teenagers. Good. That's good to know. Great question, Claudia. Well, Thank you for that yeah. one. But I also write. Yeah. So as we as we get into because we've talked about how you kind of got there and I want to lean back a little bit on on Mandy's introduction where she talked about taking a chapter and turning it into a novel and my question to you kind of stemming from that is 
how do you decide that this is a short story and not a novel? And then when do you decide I want to take this and make it more than you know? I want, there's more story to tell here. You know, you, you chose one maybe out of out of that collection that now is is a novel as opposed well, to the other stories that are in there. Or is, is there is there more to that story even? Well, the that one was actually a chapter from a novel. And then oh, the, the other one. So it was the other way around. Okay, and then in okay. um, this collection, it's so funny because Eva and uh, June Bug Fisher are two novellas in here because they were just, they did not want to be a short story. June Bug Fisher actually wants to be a novel. Um, and she might, she might have to be one day. Um, all of my stories, even in Walken, there's 16 short stories in Walken. Um, I, in my mind, I have them already all written full novel lengths. I have, and readers ask all the time, like, oh, I want to know more. And it's like, well, maybe one day they'll show up and they'll have a novel. It's every, I mean, every, every single story. <laughs> yeah. I think that as authors, we kind of have this whole peripheral offstage world that we have for our, our characters anyway, even if we're putting them in a novel, it's like there's more to their life, there's more to their world. We could write all of that in and we have to kind of rein ourselves in sometimes. But to me, I think it's really interesting to have the opportunity to take something that you've reined in so tightly and then let it kind of blossom into something bigger and really explore the story and the people a bit more. Yeah, um, Elma. So the first, the first stories in, in Walking the Wrong Way Home are Elma and Roy, two sides to every story. Elma was a short story that I'd written, gosh, I don't know, maybe 11 years ago or so. I don't know how long ago. And I just loved her. I just loved Elma. And it's her story. And she lets on a little bit about her husband and, and stuff. It's her birthday. She turned 63. And she didn't even know it was her birthday till her employer gave her a birthday card. And that's when she, hey, because nobody else, you know. Well, about five years later, six years later, I wrote Roy. Roy's side of the story, because it's two sides to every story. And then I put them together into one, you know, short story. So it's just, that was just so much fun. And then he came that much, you know, later after Alma. And then I think oh, I would love to do a chapter, give a story to Rachel and other people in the, in these little short stories and put them all. I, I'm always thinking, I'm just, I love to write, you know, constant. So I'm always, I'm always thinking of stories. So I love that. Now, Caitlin, your stories are, you know, I love, you know, the idea of kind of putting your ghost to rest and kind of exploring that side of things. What made you choose that particular subject matter for what you were writing? Or that angle, I guess. You know, it's so interesting because it wasn't planned. Um, the, the collection, I was asked to submit the if I had a collection to submit about a year before I did, and I just said no. Thank you so much, but no. And then about a year later, I thought, well, why not? And I pulled out some stories, and I looked at them, and I thought I had 10 good ones, and so I sent them in. And, um, and the publisher took the book, and he said, well, I need a title. I need some title suggestions. And I didn't want to give the title of the book to, to take it from one story, because I didn't want any one story to have that much weight. So I flipped through the book, and found five phrases I liked, and I sent him five, and he said, to lay to rest our ghosts. And so that's what that. it was. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't really understand how much that tied things together. And I think sometimes it's easy not to see things in your own writing, but mm -hmm. it is actually the perfect title for the book. So um, it's a beautiful title. I, I wish I could go back and write an email about the other four suggestions. I can't remember what they were. <laughs> I know now everybody's going to be asking, what were the other ones? I'm glad you said that because I'm sure we're about to get a whole bunch of comments about what the other suggestions were. Well, but it, it is such a beautiful yeah. title. Thank you. Yeah. And I was going to say, you know, back to the whole thing of moving things into a novel, three of the stories <laughs> in my collection connect and then separately two others do. And the three stories oh. are about Sarah. McMillan and her sister Glennie and Sarah's husband Al 
And Geographies of the Heart, my novel, finishes the story and tells what happened to them. Because I just, I, I kept writing about them. And so um, I think people were probably a little surprised that the novel was coming out. But I've been writing about these women for years, kind of like you, Mandy. We should have a coffee. We're not, you know, we're both from Tennessee <laughs> and we seem to have a similar process here. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, I just couldn't let it go. And I actually, I'm kind of sad now. I'm done now. I know I'm done. So <laughs> on to new people, new stories. I'm not the thing that there's always new people and new stories. I love that. It's just another adventure. It's like a whole other family you get to create. Well, you, you got me thinking about what prompted me to write my novel. And I want to talk about my novel just a little bit, okay? This is Wainani, sure. a voice from old Hawaii. And you might see that I'm a Hawaii if you see an auto here. But uh, what brought me to writing this is a historical novel. This will be my second historical novel based on the adventuresome life of a very strong woman in history who I felt was overlooked. So in my research for articles and story ideas and things, I ran into this woman, you know, this woman that I identified with really strongly. Both of these women, this, the Hawaii woman is Kahahumanu, and she was the favorite wife of Kamehameha the Great. So I changed all the names for Westerners to be able to remember the names. Wainani is easier, right? Mm -hmm. It's beautiful water. Point is, your, your conversation has got me thinking about what got me started with my novels. And it was my travel writing, and the research in my travel writing brought me to these characters in history that I thought was so overlooked and, and deserved amplification and uh, that I identified with because Wainani was a childless bride. I don't have children. And she was a very independent woman. Uh, and yet she, and she's very intelligent. And yet she became the favorite wife of this warrior who had 32 wives and he had like a hundred children. So I thought, you know, she's quite a woman. I, 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 I kind of like her. She's pretty cool. And, and of course, you know, Isabella Bird was incredible. And uh, so, and then a Georgie White is another one. She was the first woman to raft the Grand Canyon River and to create these pontoons that they tied together and allowed the public to raft the Grand Canyon River, the Colorado River through the Grand Canyon. So I guess that my travel writing, you know, the research for articles and essays is what's brought me to my novels. I, so I like that. Stories. But I like that. I mean, and that's, I think so many of us kind of pull things. We were talking in another, another show about how we have to really rein ourselves in as historical fiction writers, you know, where we start to do the research when we find these things, these little nuggets that we want to kind of chase down a rabbit yeah. trail and say, you know, wait a minute, that's not for this book, that's got to go somewhere else. But yeah. as, you, as you research yeah. and as you find things, you Yeah, you have to be careful not, to, not to, to be able to kill your babies and, you know, <laughs> so you gotta, gotta cut it, you know, cut it down, in. yeah, so that it's not overdone. Mm -hmm. And I love Maria that you use, you know, that your your publisher actually told you to use your own experiences for your devotionals because I, I think one of the things that ties all yeah. of these things together to me is the human experience. And whether that human experience is exploration or you know family crisis or you know growing up and, and tension and finding our own place or you know going through experiences that we need to learn and grow from is really kind of coming to the, the heart of what all of you are writing about. And I think that's what speaks to so many readers too, is there is something in all of that that we either need that you know we can kind of latch onto and identify with or something that is going to inspire us in some way, something we can relate to um, because it, they're truly stories of, of humanity and we all have those those elements and those needs to relate to other people. And sometimes we need to see people who are struggling in the same way that we are and and dealing with a lot of similar experiences, whether for you know the good, the bad, and the ugly in writing so that we don't feel quite so alone in our own human experience. So I, I love that that thread is running through so much of what you ladies 
the way you ladies write. I think it's important for the readers to see that. It mean, absolutely is. And we've got, I'm going to talk history for a minute. You ladies are awesome. We could, we could talk about your short stories forever and ever. But what I want <laughs> you guys to do, our viewers here, is go get their books. <laughs> we could talk about them all day long, but you got to go read these stories. So speaking of history, we are going to dive briefly into some New Orleans history and mystery. We're going to tell a story here, ladies. So here we go. This is time for New Orleans mystery and history. Uh, today, you are actually going to hear a true story. I know sometimes I give you the ghost story that goes with this. And I got to say, I can't believe that there's not a ghost story that goes with this story. And I think it's because the story itself um, got so very varied. And it's it's one of the, the most interesting to me. It's a very interesting story. Um, and yet doesn't make the ghost tours. Doesn't make the the, you know, none of the tour guides are out there standing in front of 715 Ursula Street and actually telling this story. And they should, because it's a good one. So we're going to learn about the trunk murders, the buried murders of the 1920s in New Orleans. So we've got, you know, fun things happening in the 20s. And yet we have the gruesome trunk murders. So we had a couple of ladies that were good friends and they were both married to a pair of brothers. So we have Teresa and Leonid Moiti. And these young ladies, uh, they're young married ladies and they just were married to some kind of shitless dudes that did a bunch of odd jobs. They had to work, they had to pick up some work uh, they weren't real thrilled about that, having to take care of the house, kids, and all of this stuff. Um, and they lived, and this is the crazy thing, the two brothers you know, were married to these two friends, and they all lived in the same house. They lived in 715 Ursula Avenue. Um, so very cold quarters to start with. Now, one of the girls decides that she's kind of had enough of her shiftless husband and her kind of life where she you know always having to pick up all the jobs and things like that so she leaves joseph but she's still living with henry <laughs> and his wife so the two women are living with henry now and you know they're all well, the kids are in there joseph must have left i mean this is all we can figure so joseph had to have moved out because he's no longer in the picture and now it's just Teresa, leonid and henry and the little kids well Teresa has moved in and I mean, uh, Leonid has moved in. She's left Joseph. So Leonid moves in and she's just having a terrible influence on Teresa, basically telling her she can do better than him. And you know, why is she having to do all this work? He should be taking care of her. And Henry's a little concerned about the influence that this woman is having on his wife. Um, now things get really bad at the home of the Moities here when Henry finds out that perhaps these ladies are quite as wholesome as he thought. So he finds out that his wife is flirting with a real estate agent who lives downstairs. I mean, not, he works downstairs. So in New Orleans, the bottom floor of the buildings is the shops and the people live above them. And so this married real estate agent lives downstairs. And I find his name. What was his name? It was a great Italian name. What was his name? Yeah, I'm going to find it. I'll come across his name here in a minute. But so the Italian real estate agent who's downstairs captures the attention of Teresa. And so they are just blatant about this. They go on streetcar rides together and notes in the dark corners. And they're you know, really not hiding anything at all from Henry. Well, the ladies decide that they're tired of this life, that they can do better. I'm sure probably prompted a bit by the real estate agent, you know, giving them more attention. And so Things get really bad when the two ladies come home and announce to Henry that they're leaving. They are going to pack the trunks and they're moving out. And Henry's wife, Teresa, waves a $10 bill in his face and says that she can make more money as a prostitute than he can make in a week doing odd jobs. And she's leaving. Well, the ladies start packing their trunks and Henry starts drinking. 
He starts drinking and he's mad. He's fuming. He doesn't know what he's going to do about this. The ladies get all packed and ready to go. They're having a lovely time getting ready for their grand adventure out in the world. And, you know, their own money made their way. <laughs> and Henry <laughs> takes a break from his blender and goes and buys a cane knife that they use to cut sugar cane on the plantations. Well, the ladies go to sleep and Henry totally gone at this point and losing the sanity just a little bit with the alcohol. He stands over Teresa kind of looking at the knife for a little bit and then starts swinging. And he kills Teresa and realizes that he's doing what he's done. And then he goes after Leonie. He goes into her room, busts into the room, and as she starts to scramble up, he attacks her too. Well, now he's got two dead women in his house. And he's got to figure something out. He dumps their trunks out that they had packed to go on their trip and sends them in a totally different type of departure. He cuts their arms, legs, and head off and puts them and packs them into the trunk and leaves. He leaves. So even at modest means back then, people could still have you know a hired housekeeper that would come in and do some light cleaning for them. And so the next morning, the housekeeper shows up, and of course, she comes across this absolutely gruesome scene, this bloody mess everywhere. And she freaks out. But what she does is she freaks out. And this is the this is the best thing. Nettie Compass is her name. And she freaks out and runs outside. And two insurance men were walking down the street and she gets them to come in the house with her to see what she's found. So they come in, one of the insurance men calls a newspaper reporter. No <laughs> one's called the police yet. <laughs> they called the newspaper reporter. <laughs> and so they go in and try to look around. So here's, here's the, um, Newspaper reporter later on wrote a memoir about all of this. So there's very little about this other than a newspaper article the day after, and then this man's memoir. And so here's what he was said. We found red stains on the floor and saw a large trunk in a bedroom partially open. When I pulled up the trunk lid, a woman's body, arms, and legs were severed from the torso, severed from the torso and was exposed. So then Healy, I know it's not funny, people were chopped up. The story itself is funny. But Haley still doesn't call the police. He calls another reporter friend of his. He's like, dude, get over here. you got to see this. This is crazy. So he calls the other reporter over. And, the, and then a friend of his, too, a, a woman who's a reporter and a friend of his. And then they finally decide, oh, we should call the coroner. So then they decide to call the coroner. Not the police, the coroner. <laughs> So oh, they're dead. I don't know what we're going to do. So then they call But Gwen, Healy's newspaper reporter friend, shows up. <laughs> Gwen, I'm sorry, but as a reporter, a woman reporter in the 20s goes, this woman sort of embodies the roaring 20s to me because she's a badass. This is a badass reporter. <laughs> this is Healy's memoir. This is what this woman does. She charged into the apartment and invited several objects on the bed. Look, said Gwen, holding up these objects, lady fingers, four fingers, and she's holding them. Four fingers had been cut from a woman's hand. After placing the fingers back on the bed, Gwen moved to a second bedroom, found a second trunk, and opened it. It contained a woman's body. So Gwen's over there picking up fingers and opening trunks. I'm like, woman. So Gwen has, has found the other body. And one of the fingers was missing a wedding ring, which they later found in a wound in the woman's back. So Henry lost his ever-loving mind when he did that. Not only did he cut her fingers off to take her wedding ring off, but he shoved it in her back. I guess that's what you call getting stabbed in the back. Wow. Um, this is where some of these phrases come from. So all of these women, you know, their, their stuff is strewn everywhere and it's all in the blood. But here's an interesting thing that kind of ties this story to our theme of the night. Here, here we go. I got to read this one straight up to you. So Teresa and Leonie's personal effects lay strewn among the gore. Children's clothing, unfinished sewing projects, the women's lace, the women's lace gar garments, silk stockings, and beauty queens. In a turn worthy of pulp fiction, a manuscript written in Leonie's hand was discovered hidden in the cabinet of her bedroom, rife with grammatical errors. The thin, thinly veiled autobiographical story cautioned young girls to be careful for marriage is a life sentence. 
<laughs> it gets better. The rejection slip from her submission to a popular confessions magazine lay in a pool of her own blood. <laughs> Yay. So the ladies, uh, the ladies had a bit of a, a different adventure than they planned to. But now Henry eventually confesses to the whole thing. They catch him with him in prison. And he was reported to be one of the best inmates they ever had. He smoked, he painted, he was well behaved, he was the entertained curious guests that wanted to hear his story. He said the day he died, he loved his wife and in fact listed himself as married to her on the census reports. And he painted portraits. So our shitless odd job doer guy paints portraits in jail and painted a portrait of Governor Huey Long that hung in the governor's mansion for a while. He later died in California of a stroke in prison, in Folsom Prison, and he is buried there. So that is the wow. story of the Trunk Murders of New Orleans, 1927, <laughs> October 1927. Wow. So you'll never hear that story on anywhere a else. <laughs> nope. And I don't know why. I think it's an inter I mean, it's a good story. Why are they not telling the story? They tell all of these other stories you can't even prove. You got this story's in the newspaper. Like, don't <laughs> tell the right stories, people. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's a true story. It was in the Times Picayune. There you go. It's in the newspaper. So, anyway, that is our trunk story. So, we're going to go from gruesome to, I don't know. Maybe also horrible and gruesome. We're going to talk a little bit about <laughs> the Halloween costumes. Uh, those costumes that perhaps were nightmarish on their own day. So I'm, I'm going to be bringing here. Here are some Halloween costumes of me and my cousins and my little brother. So <laughs> apparently oh. my family had this thing with clowns. These clown costumes kept making reappearances. <laughs> different cousins got to be different ages. <laughs> so, the, the little red riding hood over here on the left is me. This is the little clown next to me is my cousin Erica, who is almost exactly a year younger than me, and her little brother Brandon. Those are my cousins. And then we're over here. The witch is my aunt Susan. I'm the little clown in green over there. My cousin Erica in the same costume. And I think I wore it one year too. <laughs> so, the red clown <laughs> costume, lots of us wear. I believe my brother wore the green one one. I, just, I don't like clowns to this day. And my brother, a little blonde in my aunt's lap, they're pulling the mask off of his face. <laughs> is, who knows what he is at that particular time. Remember, remember those masks, those horrible masks? They were like the plastic thing with the little strap around the back. And, and the like, eyes were never, you could never see out of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 There's this little mouth you're supposed to breathe out of. We think masks today are bad. Come on, guys. Yeah. <laughs> That's all I remember. Yeah. 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 Ripping it off of his face. <laughs> like, I'm not doing it anymore. But, you know, you, you look very you know, helpless in our clown costumes. That, there are a lot of pictures of the cousins in a variety of assemblage of one of us in various clown costumes. It's like every year, you know, has the clown costumes around. We all hated it too. I mean, none of us liked them. We all wanted to be other things. But I gotta tell you, some of my, those are, the clown costumes were, I mean, they were cute, they were handmade, gotta love them. But I mean, it was like enough is enough of the clowns after a while. But I gotta tell you, I wish I had a picture of it and somewhere there is a picture of it and maybe I'm glad that we don't have it. But one year, my brother and I went dressed as, he was a California raisin, a homemade Halloween costume. My mom just made her costumes this year. My brother was a California raisin. <laughs> so we had taken like a trash bag and stuffed it and then painted it so he'd be stiff. <laughs> and then he had his arms sticking out. <laughs> a raisin. So he was a California raisin. He had them sunglasses and everything, like high tops. <laughs> so he was a California raisin. And I, of course, also rocking the trash bag because this is the material I had to work with. I turned it into a bee costume, but I couldn't go with a California raisin and just be a bee. So I had a Nerf gun and I was a killer bee. <laughs> <laughs> we were in California and Both of us dressed unceremoniously in 
trash bags and <laughs> toilet paper. <laughs> on it. This was all purple and my yellow stripes. I don't know if this is funny or whether it's tragic, but <laughs> as a, but, but it's as like a Trump murder story. Uh, is it tragic or funny? I, I'm not sure. But as an adult, I mean, I, I had a sad little childhood. Like I said, we didn't. We weren't normal like you. We weren't raisins and killer bees. Is this normal? Yeah, we weren't normal like you. <laughs> But I, 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 I do remember those horrible masks. But as an adult, I, I wanted to, I always wanted to go to a great Halloween party, okay? And, and, and so here in California, you know, it, Halloween is a huge holiday here. I mean, they go all out, all right? But I, I didn't even have any money to go all out. And so, you know how you, um, I don't know if you ladies have ever done this with egg white where you just take the egg white and you put it on your face and you make a mask of it. Mm -hmm. And it's supposed to tighten your pores and all of that. Well, what it does is it, it makes you look like a burn victim, right? Your whole <laughs> face. <laughs> right? And, you, and I, I lived alone. And when I did that, I thought, oh, this is funny. <laughs> this is so funny. I'm going to go to the Halloween party. And I'm literally going to have egg on my face, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, you I know, I'm part of this. I'm like a 20 in my 20s, right? And I'm going to this hip Halloween party with all these cool people. You know, they're all cool. And they're, you know, some of them are cute and young. And I'm like, I'd like to know. But as soon as I walk in, that people just backed away from me in waves. <laughs> they were so they were so grossed out. And I really learned a lot, you know, um, in the moment about how people react to people with disabilities and things, you know. It's true. And I was like, oh I thought, my God, if I'm gonna dance tonight, I've got to get rid of this egg in my face, you know, this is like not gonna work. And they literally were back and backing away from me. <laughs> Maybe they so, were worried about salmonella. <laughs> even, I don't know. Even, even, you know, everybody was in costumes. But even the host, even the host came up to me and he said, you gotta, you got to get rid of that. You got to get rid of that. I went, okay, okay, okay. I go, I wash my face, I get the egg off, and I come out, and I have a wonderful time. But that's my very tragic story because... I learned a lot about how yeah. people react to conformity. Well, the good news <laughs> is, though, egg white makes a great facial. You just peel it off. You yes, it was fine. It, 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 it was a great facial. It did work, and it was great, for God's sake. You know? <laughs> it's like a, you were, you were just demonstrating it before and after. <laughs> what came out of the bathroom? Like, yeah, no. I mean, I, I had a good time after that. You know. <laughs> so that's my egg on your face story. <laughs> when I was little, my dad was the was the dad that would take all the kids trick or treating. So all of my friends came over. Like all the parents loved it because my dad he was like a big kid. So all the parents they didn't have to go. They would just stay hang out at the house with my mom, give out candy. And my friends would like have all these costumes, like you know, they were princesses and you know, whatever cute, like cute costumes. Cute people, yeah. Not, my dad here every year. This is it. <clears throat> had a white hoodie that I wore to play in with you know to keep your hands warm. Pull it up, white um, shoe polish, white shoe <laughs> polish. Smear black under. I was like a, a ghoul every year. That was, that was it. <laughs> That's all you got. <laughs> that was it. Why did I need some shoe polish? Why did you polish? And then white. I'm not sure what the black stuff was, but black around my eyes, so I look like. And then you pull up the white hood, and so I was like a scary guy. But every year, that was it. Every year. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> friends would be like, you know, princesses and cheerleaders and whatever. And yeah. Oh, <laughs> we came yeah, around and got candy and cared. 
I don't know. I think this is sad. I think this is sad. <laughs> Oh, we're gonna call our own horror story here. We don't need the trunk martyrs. We got our own thousand horror stories. <laughs> oh, hey, Deborah King's here. I saw you earlier, girl. We love us, Deborah King. She's like shoe polish. What did they do to you, Caitlin? Yes. What did you? What happened to you? <laughs> We made a lot of our costumes like you guys. And I just want to say, I think my kids have missed out. Because, you know, when you go down to the Halloween store and you uh, buy you know, do it all the movie people, or the, I mean, half the fun mm -hmm. was making the costumes. So, um, you know, one year I dressed as a, as a pig. And I was so proud of my costume. My, friend, my best friend went as, I can't even remember what she went as, but I dressed as a pig. And, and a lady asked me if I, was, if I would snort. And, and I did it. <laughs> you get extra candy. We like, <laughs> should have got extra candy for that. I guess I'm not. Sorry. That's a good one. No. You know, you know um, what's so sad is I'm sure she told that story all through the neighborhood. You know, I got that little kid who was a pig to snort. You know, so <laughs> as you guys know, it's not even happening again. Oh, God. That's so funny. Maria, what about you? Well, I actually have a trash bag story. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I was I was a little worried that I didn't have a good story. And then you told your trash bag story. And I'm, and I'm like, okay, I'm in, you know. <laughs> but uh, my my mom didn't make costumes. So it was up to my older sister. And she decided that I was going to be like a gum ball machine. So we filled up a, a clear trash bag and filled them up with balloons. So the balloons oh, were like yeah. the gum balls. That's smart. Yeah. That's actually cute. That's yeah. probably cuter than that one. <laughs> I mean, I like that one though. Yeah, in theory, creative. you weren't too That's smart so with cutting off like, the, you know, sealing the parts because there were balloons falling out constantly. <laughs> so, you know, it, it wasn't a pretty sight. It was, it was just like I'm like I lost another balloon. Like they're just come flying out of me and yeah, dropping gumballs really, everywhere. <laughs> yeah, dropping gumballs. You know, it was, it was really weird. So, <laughs> and. and Andy, I had the same thing where I had the same stupid costume every year when I got older. And I was like, my mom had this ugly sweater. And she looked like a hobo. So I thought, well, I'm going to wear this and be a hobo. And I just got one of my dad's ties. And I got a stick. And I got like a handkerchief and tied it on to it. And, you know, dirt on my face and like his baggy pants and like his shoes. And I was a hobo over you. Well, you were comfortable. And you were great. It was so um, Now, I got to ask, yep. after you turned that sweater of your mom's that she wore into a hobo costume, did she continue to wear the sweater? Or was it like, now I look like a hobo? <laughs> I, you know what? I don't remember her really wearing it. I like I don't even remember how I got it. Like I would just kind of rummage through stuff, and you know, like when I was younger, even like I was before I was even old enough, probably even to wear makeup. I was like ten years old, and I'm putting on makeup, and my mom was like, oh, where did you get that? And I'm like, uh, in your bathroom. <laughs> she was like, oh, that's nice. And then she started doing her makeup, and she hardly ever wore makeup, and I, like, inspired her, you know, to, like, wear it that night or something, and um, so I, you know, and I shouldn't have been, like, rummaging through my mom's stuff, you know, my, but I, you know, I did. I, I admit it. And then, yeah. like, for costumes or, yeah. like, performances, I literally gave away clothes from my mom's closet, like, fur coats and things like that, like, not thinking, and yeah. never got them back. You know, like, oh. real. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it, it was, well, like, I don't know what I was thinking, because they were, like, period times, and my mom had, like, all these old things, and I'm like, oh, this will work for this performance, you know, the musical, to make it more authentic, and, you know, this way that they won't have to design the costumes. 
And, I, and I'm like, what was I thinking? Oh, oh no. gosh, that's so sad to not have all of that stuff. But Caitlin, I gotta tell you, I, I agree with you. I think our kids are missing out on stuff. They don't have any trash bag stories. Like, what, what are they gonna tell when they go on a live show on social media one day? <laughs> They're not gonna have a trash bag story. I mean, come on. You gotta have a story. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Not the same at all. Not the same at all. This was so much fun. Okay, we, we can talk. I, I love you guys. We've been talking all night long. We get to other things. It's been over an hour. Um, Y'all are amazing. Um, one of the things that I want to make sure that we mention, I told you I was, I'm going to interrupt Annie here for just a minute. I got on my One Love Dog Rescue awesome shirt here oh, with my friends. Look at it. It's like wishes and paw prints, and it's so cute, my little dandy lane. Oh, it's one nice. Love Dog Rescue is um, near and dear to Annie McDonald's heart, and she does a lot of work with One Love. And they are also so good to her as well. So I'm going to give a shout out to One Love Dog Rescue and on behalf of Annie McDonald, and who does an amazing job producing this show, y'all, and getting our guests lined up and, and helping me out on that side of things. Um, love her to death. Um, One Love is doing a fundraiser right now. They are, are working on an online auction, a, a, a virtual auction, auction. They've got some puppies there with Parvo that have got some medical bills that they are trying to raise some money for to help get those puppies healthy and adoptable again. So if you guys are um, connected to Annie McDonald, you can check out her information. She's posted some information there. She sent me a graphic I'm gonna post on my pages as well. And if you wanna just go on Facebook and look for One Love Dog Rescue Inc, then you can find them there as well and see what they've got going on. They do great work with dog rescues and they are also great at giving to people as well. They're taking amazing care of Annie who also takes amazing care of their puppies as well. So um, shout out to One Love and Annie McDonald on that one. Um, also want to, you know, Nolan News here, it's my show. I can talk about my book and Annie says I never talk enough about my own book. And so here we go. Crescent City Sandwich is the sequel to Crescent City Moon is now available for Kindle pre-orders on Amazon. The Kindle will be delivered to your device on October 28th. If you go ahead and get that now, print version should have to go on, on sale right about that same time. If you have not read Crescent City Moon, I highly suggest you start there because it does pick up where Crescent City Sun picks up where Crescent City Moon leaves off. So make sure that you are checking that out. And as you're checking out things on Amazon and a variety of books, these ladies have got some great ones out there. So make sure that you are checking out their books support your local authors and our authors on our show find your next great read you know some of the stories we've introduced these books to you so now go see what it's all about when you check their books out um help an author out these are these are tough times to get out and promote books y'all it's we're doing everything that we can to kind of get things out there and, and get the word out. It's, we can't do our usual events as you know, going around the communities and touring around and, and doing signings. So um, I'm grateful for the time that you guys have given to us tonight. The stories that you've told us, the laughs that we've shared, it's been a lot of fun, ladies. And I am so glad that we had this time together. Thank you for giving up your evening to entertain all of us. We do have lots of comments still coming in. Um, yep, see, oh, see me, oh, that was the other thing. Oh, thanks, Christine, uh, for reminding me to actually talk about some other things that I've got going on. Uh, tomorrow, I will be on Tell Me Your Secrets with Carrie and King, um, talking about my new book coming out then. And also, I'm taking over High Society Book Club on Facebook on Friday the 16th. Um, and I will be um, doing an interview with Christine Davis at 7 p.m. Central. So that'll be a whole lot of fun, too. So events coming up. Annie's still popping in. Thank you, love. Glad you are here with us. And she's so excited to watch the show. I'm grateful for her support all the time. So, oh, Elgin, thank you for the shout out. I appreciate it. Uh, Elgin's been reading for me as well. Um, so he's been uh, doing a little pre-reading on that book for me and proofing it for me and getting some good comments back from Elgin. So thank you very much, Elgin, for all the great nice. things that you have to say about Crescent City Sin. Um, I gotta tell you, I, I love that book. I say that about all the books that I write, I guess, but Crescent City Sin, I just, 
I, it was fun getting just into the gritty side of New Orleans with that one. It was a little darker, a little grittier, and that's just fun to write. So fun to write. All right, so ladies, thank you so much for joining me. Um, it was fun. Welcome back to the time. Thank you, Nola. You are so welcome. And uh, thank all you, of our folks are Thank you. Thank you so much. If you guys are leaving comments, um, we will continue to check those out. I know that I will. If you want to watch this episode again, or if you want to check out any past episodes of the Second Line Show, they are all there for you on the YouTube channel, Noah Nash Entertainment, where you can watch the very first one all the way to the one that we have been doing for you tonight. And it's live on YouTube right now, and it will be living there from here on out. So feel free to revisit if any of these stories sparked an interest and you want to go back and see which one of these lovely ladies' books that that story was from. That's how you're going to find out. All right, ladies, thank you so much. I've enjoyed our time. We are out. Thank you.